Thank you to you, Mr. Botala, and to the organizers of uh, CASR 2020 for giving me this opportunity to speak. I'm honored to uh, be one of the speakers at this uh, lovely international conference. I'm going to, my name is Raja Guhatakurta. I'm a professor and department chair of astronomy and astrophysics at the University of California, Santa Cruz. And uh, I'm gonna talk about spectroscopy using the Keck telescope and DEMOS spectrograph of resolved stellar populations of galaxies in the neighborhood of the Milky Way in the local group and somewhat beyond. And the three science themes I'll cover are the assembly of galaxies and their dark matter halos, their chemical evolution, and certain kinds of rare stars that are seen in these galaxies. So I wanted to um, show you a picture of the wonderful Keck telescopes on the summit of Merakea. And we as astronomers are truly privileged to make use of this sacred mountaintop that's had a tremendous significance to the native Hawaiian community for many, many years before uh, the University of California started using um, you know, the mountaintop for its telescopes. I wanted to acknowledge that. And um, moving forward, this is the theme of my talk. I'll talk about the assembly of the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, then, um, and I'll be talking about two surveys, the Halo 70 survey and the next generation Virgo cluster survey when I talk about the Milky Way. Uh, then I'll talk about three galaxies in the local group, M31, M32, and M33. And I'll be talking about them through the lens of three surveys named SPLASH, FAT, and HST PROMO. And finally, I'll talk about galaxies in nearby groups of galaxies. Nearby being a relative term, of course. This is all astronomical uh, in terms of distances. And I'll talk about that through the lens of the Pisces survey. All right, plunging right into the Milky Way halo then. Uh, the, uh, I'll present some results from the Halo 7D survey that's been going on for a few years now. And um, what this survey entails is looking at the stellar halo of the Milky Way. But because the stellar halo of the Milky Way is very sparse, we both look at and through the stellar halo of the Milky Way. Our main Science objective is to study the three-dimensional kinematics of representative stellar populations along five lines of sight uh, to the Milky Way halo, to and through the Milky Way halo. And most of this work is described in three papers listed there, all led by Emily Cunningham, a former PhD student. But there are many others involved in this work and I uh, thought um, I would uh, show you who they are. Uh, their names are uh, shown in this um, uh, at the bottom here. The names of the young people are underlined. These are graduate students and postdocs whose names are underlined here. And again, to give you the details, the, it's a two-part survey. We use the Hubble Space Telescope. There's an archival legacy program where we use multiple epochs of Hubble Space Telescope, HST imaging, to measure the subtle movement of stars relative to the distant galaxy wallpaper, the cosmic wallpaper is used as a reference frame against which we measure the proper motion of about a thousand main sequence stars, main sequence turnoff stars in the remote halo of the Milky Way. We also use Keck and Deimos to carry out, we have used it to carry out a very deep spectroscopy program where our exposure times range from eight to 32 hours. And we got spectra of about a quarter of the stars for which we have proper motions, about 250 stars uh, in these four fields and the M31 foreground, five lines of sight. Uh, we measured radial velocities for these stars and um, my student Kem Kevin McKinnon is measuring chemical abundances. I'll say a little bit about that. And as a byproduct, we got spectra of nearly uh, 1500 distant galaxies and papers are being written on those galaxies as well. Um, this is Emily Cunningham. This was part of her PhD thesis and the Halo 7D survey was really started while Alice Deason, who's now a professor at Durham, was a postdoc at UC Santa Cruz. So I wanted to acknowledge their contribution uh, really to leading this survey. Um, moving on, uh, one of the things that, one of the main results from Emily Cunningham's second paper last year, 2019b, was she was able to measure three-dimensional kinematics of Milky Way halo stars in four fields. The four fields are colored in these four colors here, blue, orange, green, and red. Uh, and you can see that we measure their mean rotation speed, 
in phi, uh, average of V phi. We measure the dispersion in the radial, uh, sorry, this is getting hidden. Let me see if I can move this out of the way. Um, radial, phi, and theta direction, theta being the elevation angle. And you can see that the velocity distributions of stars are, um, you know, while there are some similarities, there are some striking differences as well. And in the final panel here on the, on the lower right, you can see that we have measured the anisotropy parameter. This is the um, parameter that tells you whether on average, the stars are moving on radial or tangential orbits. So uh, you can see that the beta distributions of stars are quite different for the four fields. Pointing to the Milky Way halo being not smooth, but lumpy. And in the upper right panel, what you're seeing is the line of sight distances of these stars. So these are, you're seeing um, six of the dimensions of halo 70, three uh, dimensions of position and three dimensions of velocity. Um, I'm gonna move next to, to the seventh dimension, which is a dimension of chemical abundances. And it's actually more than one dimension. This is the work of Kevin McKinnon and you can see that he's measuring the ratio of alpha elements to iron, alpha over Fe on the y-axis, as a function of the iron abundance. This is for individual stars here. And uh, on the right are the line of sight averages for our four fields, and then the overall average for all four fields. And here's Kevin McKinnon, uh, selfie taken on Mauna Kea with the Keck telescopes in the background. But Kevin's PhD thesis is in progress and he's writing papers on the chemical abundances of stars in the Milky Way halo. All right, um, another PhD student who's working with us at UC Santa Cruz is studying the accretion history of the Milky Way. And what you see in the top and bottom rows are two computer simulations carried out by James Bullock and Catherine Johnston in 2005, two simulated halos of Milky Way sized galaxies. Uh, these are dark matter particle, dark matter simulations, where uh, from those we have simulated star particles using the Galaxia software, Sanjeev Sharma uh, software. And what you see first in the left panel, leftmost panel, are these black dots tell you something about the accretion history in these simulated galaxies. The top panel shows you a galaxy that has no recent accretion, virtually no recent accretion, in fact, zero recent accretion in the first in the second half of Hubble time. So um, only accretion events have time since accretion um, is more than eight giga years. So nothing in the last seven giga years. Whereas the second halo down here has some significant relatively late accretion. And what you should see is if you look at the measurements of in this case velocities, across, you look at differences across four lines of sight, and these are cumulative histograms, you can see that the cumulative histograms are tightly bunched together in the galaxy that had early accretion, that has had time for things to virialize and smooth out, whereas a galaxy that has had recent accretion, the cumulative histograms are much more varied across the four lines of sight. So these are, again, this is based on a simulation, based on a paper that Miranda Apfel is in the process of writing, and there's Miranda. Okay. Um, one more thing I'll say about the Milky Way halo, and this comes not from the Halo 70 survey, but from a different survey called the Next Generation Virgo Cluster Survey, NGVS. And we have used it to search for pulsating RLRI stars. NGVS stands for Next Generation Virgo Cluster Survey. The survey was designed to study galaxies in the Virgo cluster, but as a serendipitous angle to this survey, we can measure stars in the Milky Way halo that's in the foreground of the Virgo cluster, and we can measure pulsating stars. We can look for and find pulsating stars in this 100 square degree uh, imaging survey and four filters. Uh, the four filters are UGIZ, so ultraviolet to near infrared. And um, the other characteristic about this survey is we took repeat exposure. So we have time domain measurements, time resolved brightness measurements, that allowed us to look for pulsating stars, foreground Milky Way halo RLRI. Um, the bottom line is we've discovered the most distant RLRI known in the halo of the Milky Way. 40% of the distance between us and our next nearest neighbor, the Andromeda galaxy. Of course, we're not looking in the direction of Andromeda, we're looking in the direction of the Virgo cluster. This is a paper that uh, my student Yu Ting Feng is working on, uh, a little bit more about his work. Uh, this is uh, one of these wedge diagrams showing distance 
on the x-axis and the right ascension on the y-axis. And you can see that the points for which we have absolutely secured detections are shown in red. The points that are we consider more marginal at this point are shown as uh, in black, black triangles versus red circles. You can see that we've discovered stars that go out certainly beyond 250, even out beyond 300 kiloparsecs from the sun. And um, if you want to get a sense of what these stars, how they were discovered, here are brightness measurements as a function of phase. So these are folded light curves. And we have roughly 30 data points per star across these four filters. We have very good photometric precision. You can see the size of the arrow bars are small. And it's very easy to see when a star's brightness is not constant, when it's changing. You can see a very good fit to templates of well-studied RLRA. Now, you see two kinds of RLRA here, a class called RRAB. These have very asymmetric light curves, whereas the RRC, um, you know, overtone pulsations tend to look more sinusoidal in, in nature. I'm showing, showing you an example of each. These are distant stars uh, for which we can measure these very precise light curves. No question about what uh, they are. Uh, we've done a test where we've taken known RLRA in this direction. There are 84 known RLRA from the PanSTARS-1 survey. And we can recover them. We can recover their periods quite well. And that's what's shown in this graph, the accurate measurement of the parameters of these pulsating stars. These are periods measured in days. And our precision is better than minutes, you know, better than a minute. The reason we're able to do this is our survey has very good photometric precision. This is the photometric error in the G-band as a function of magnitude. And you can see compared to some of the other surveys that are out there, very much large, uh, very much larger than ours in terms of area, the dark energy survey and the HIT survey, that our photometric precision is better. And this is what allows us to find these very distant RLRA. And um, you know, just for comparison, the NGVS, uh, our survey single epoch photometry um, is such that it's about 1.7 magnitudes deeper than DES and about 2.3 magnitudes deeper than HITS. And again, this is the work of Yuting Feng at UC Santa Cruz. Okay. I'm going to speed up a little and talk next about the Andromeda Galaxy's disk and satellite interactions. And before I do that, I wanted to show you this little movie of the, you can see the arc of the Milky Way here, and you can see the Andromeda Galaxy two and a half million light years away. And we're gonna zoom in in this movie so you can see the details of the galaxy. And the details that you're going to see are brought to you courtesy of the Hubble Space Telescope. This is courtesy of a large survey called FAT that I'm proud to be part of. And um, what you're about to see as we zoom in some more are actual images taken with the Hubble Space Telescope where you can clearly see the variation in colors among stars. You can see dark patches of interstellar dust and gas in the Andromeda galaxy. So we are using this survey to do our science, but we're also taking spectra of these stars with the Keck telescope. So using these data, uh, my former student, Claire Dorman, studied the kinematics of Andromeda's disk, how stars are moving in the disk of Andromeda as a function of their lifetime, as a function of their age. So short-lived stars are shown in the upper left, Long-lived stars are shown in the lower left, and you can see a very clear difference in the color of the points. The color of the points is a measure of how ordered or disordered the motion is. The darker the color, the more ordered the motion. The lighter the color, the more disordered the motion. And you can see very clearly that going from young or short-lived to intermediate age to long-lived stars, there's a very clear trend in the color of the points, indicating that as stars, uh, as you look at longer and longer lived stars, you see more chaotic kinematics. I'm showing you a color magnitude diagram on the upper right that shows you how we defined our short lived, intermediate age, and long lived population. We actually divided the population into four parts. That's what you see in the upper right short lived in blue, uh, intermediate age populations were split into two parts. Uh, bright AGB, faint AGB, these are intermediate mass, intermediate age, asymptotic giant branch stars. And then the long lived population are low mass, like solar mass, uh, red giant branch stars. And in a nutshell, this is what their kinematics show. You can see that the long lived stars marked in red have very high velocity dispersion, line of sight velocity dispersion, about 100 kilometers per second, where that number is more like 20 or 20 to 40 for the shortest lived populations. 
Here's another way of representing the same thing. Velocity dispersion as a function of stellar age. And there's a very clear trend suggesting uh, that, you know, one of the ways of explaining this is if Andromeda's disk is constantly being stirred, either through internal things like bars from molecular clouds or external factors like satellite bombardment, that could explain the kind of trend we see. The trend is steeper and has a higher zero point than the trend seen in Milky Way stars. Mind you, the Milky Way measurements are local to the solar neighborhood, whereas the Andromeda measurements are more global in nature. And this was the work of Claire Dorman's PhD thesis, and there's Claire. She finished her PhD thesis five years ago. Okay, uh, taking another step, I'm gonna talk about another PhD student who looks at the, who's looked at the asymmetric drift, that is the difference in the lag in rotation speed between the stars and gas. And every dot in this diagram is a star. And it's in the upper panels, again, grouped into four uh, lifetime groups, shortest lifespan to longest lifespan. And every dot in the upper panel, the color of the dot is given by the velocity of the star. You see the color bar on the right. In the lower panel, instead of showing you the velocity of the star, I'm showing you the mean velocity of the star's neighbors. So there's less scatter in the lower panel than in the upper panel. You see a very clear pattern of disk rotation, but you can also see very clearly that the youngest stars have a yellow color here, whereas the oldest stars have more of a pink or red color here, suggesting that the rotation speed is highest for the shortest lived stars. The asymmetric drift is smallest for the shortest lived stars. So this is a measure of asymmetric drift. That is the difference between the velocity of the stars and the velocity of the neutral hydrogen. Uh, that's how we are measuring asymmetric drift. That's what the proxy we are using for uh, asymmetric drift as a function of stellar age. And uh, again, you can see the, it, the colors are dark here, meaning low asymmetric drift, and bright here, meaning high asymmetric drift as we march from short lived to long lived. All right, um, then, um, and this is the work of Amanda Quirk at UCSC. She's a fourth year PhD student at Santa Cruz. Um, I'm now going to switch gears to the galaxy M32. And one of the things we're studying, uh, my collaborators and I are studying, are M32's interaction with the disk of Andromeda. You see the disk of Andromeda there. So uh, our goal is to measure the relative absolute proper motion and line of sight velocity between M32 and the local uh, M31 disk, and we're using a combination of multi-epoch HST images, proper motions of stars relative to distant galaxies. We're using a color magnitude diagram from Hubble as well. And we're using Keck DMOS spectra to get line of sight velocities to determine spectral type and membership, whether something belongs to M32 or M31. And we are also using Gaia as an M31 disk astrometric reference frame. And of course, the M32, M31 mix depends strongly on sky position. When you're close to M32, the mix is dominated by M32. When you're far away, you're dominated by M31's disk. So just to show you, this is the ACS, HST ACS pointing within which we're gonna measure proper motions. These are some Keck DMOS masks, those, those funny shaped outlines. And you can very clearly see a bimodal velocity distribution. But if you go close to, um, and one of those is from M31's disk, one of those is from M32. If you go close to M32, you see mostly M32 and the disk of M31 suppressed. And if you go close to far away from M32, you see mostly M31's disk over here and very little M32. Okay. So we also use color magnitude diagram information. M32 mostly has old stars, whereas M31's disk has a mix of old and young stars. We take advantage of that. And this is the work of Mark Fardell and collaborators. It's a paper in preparation. Okay, switching gears one more time, my last few minutes is I'm going to talk about M33 stellar disk. And this is a triangulum galaxy. It's the uh, largest spiral after Andromeda and the Milky Way in the local group. And one of the things that Carrie Gilbert, former PhD student of UC, at UC Santa Cruz has measured is she sees that the velocity distribution is well fit by the sum of two components, a narrow component that you see in blue and a broad component that you see in red. The old stars um, have a disk whose uh, dispersion is 25 kilometers per second and a dynamically hot, what appears to be non-rotating component. That's the first uh, robust detection of the halo of M33. The young stars, if I blink back and forth, <coughs> sorry, the young stars have a slightly narrower 
uh, uh, distribution. You can see 19 versus 25. If I blink between the two, you can see the blue curves are slightly different. The old, uh, old stars, it's 25 versus young, uh, young stars, it's 20, 19. And this is the work of Carrie Gilbert and Amanda Quirk, uh, work in progress. Finally, I want to say a little bit about going beyond the local group and looking at co-added spectra of surface brightness fluctuations. This is work uh, that we started in a galaxy three and a half megaparsecs away. So four times the distance to Andromeda, stars are 16 times fainter. This particular satellite galaxy, sorry, this particular dwarf galaxy appeared to have a tidal stream near it. That's what you see in the lower left here. And we took spectra of what looked like individual points of light, but they turned out to be blends of stars when you have an HST image. So we took spectra of blends, so nature blends those stars for us, and then we co-add those spectra to measure the H alpha absorption line here and the calcium triplet. And from this, we can measure velocities and get some constraints on chemical composition. We've done this for not just for that galaxy you saw, but also for a galaxy in Sculptor, NGC 253 satellite, tidally disrupting satellite. And you can see a clear velocity gradient. This is position on the x-axis. And you can see a clear velocity gradient along the stream. You can see that in this lower right panel. OK. Um, and here's another set of streams in the Centaurus A halo. Uh, and this is work that's being led by Elisa Toloba and Tania Sanoevich. These are they are both starting faculty at uh, University of the Pacific and University of Tampa, respectively. Um, I don't have time to go into the details of uh, rare stellar populations in M31 and M33. I'll just say that we've discovered some carbon stars and we've even discovered a new flavor of stars called weak CN stars. But, uh, and this is the work of Katie Hamron and several high school students and undergraduates who've been working with us. But in closing, I want to put up my, um, my summary slide uh, in which I didn't get to talk about the last two bullet points, but I'll leave you with this. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, for Professor. That was a very interesting topic. Actually, we have uh, some time because one of the next presenter is not available here. So if you want to continue, we can also continue. All right. Um, I would love to go over the yeah. weak CN stars in a bit more detail then, if that's okay. Um, so I will, I'll, I'll take a minute to do that. Um, should I take about five minutes, you think? Or, sure, sure. Uh, okay, thank you. So the part that I rushed through that I want to spend a little bit more time on is talking about rare stars in the Andromeda and Triangulum galaxies. What you see here on the left are three representative spectra. You can see their signal to noise is marked in the next to the spectra. And if this, uh, what you're seeing here in these three spectra are, is not noise, these very uh, sharp corrugations you see in the spectra are not noise because if you look carefully, those corrugations are present in all three spectra, not just, you know, across these are three different stars in Andromeda. Um, these features, it turns out, are produced by molecules, carbonaceous molecules, CN, cyanogen, C2, CH. Um, and so the carbon stars have been studied for a long time in the Milky Way and in Andromeda and the local group. And if you pay attention to 8,000 angstroms, you'll see there's a, a feature that's shaped like a W, the letter W, two U's, produced by cyanogen. That's what this pink band shows. Now, what we discovered is there's a bunch of stars in, in Andromeda that look otherwise normal. They have titanium oxide at uh, here around um, 6,200 angstroms. They have titanium oxide again here at 7,100 angstroms. That's what marked in blue. They have the calcium triplet at 8,500 angstrom, calcium, singly ionized calcium infrared triplet. But if you look closely at 8,000 angstrom, you see a hint of a W, a really weak W. I'm tracing it with my cursor. You see another weak W here. We found about 200 stars that have a shadow of CN in addition to oxygen-rich molecules, no, and oxygen group molecules like titanium oxide, et cetera. So we started calling these weak CN stars, and this was the work of Katie Hamron's PhD thesis. And as I said, um, several, uh, several undergraduates, three undergraduates, Caleb, Rachel, and Torin are undergraduates. The other four are high school students who worked uh, with us for several summers. And they found that these carbon stars and weak CN stars occupy different parts of the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. These are really color magnitude diagrams, proxies for HR diagrams. Uh, 
taken with the Hubble Space Telescope filters, so infrared uh, on the x-axis, um, or infrared magnitude and colors, and in this case, blue and red. And in this case, um, again, combination of infrared and optical. And again, you can see that the carbon stars are shown in green. The weak CN stars are shown in blue here, shown in orange here, sorry for changing the colors on you. But the main thing is, if you compare them to model tracks from the part of a group, parsec tracks, you find that the weak CN stars are associated with stars that are not solar mass, but in the mass range, maybe three to 10 solar masses. And it's hard to see from this, but you can see that the, the upper three tracks or the upper four tracks that cover the mass range four, five, 10, 12, they bracket these orange points quite well, not the green and blue isochrones or tracks that really um, go through these black points, but not through these orange points. So based on this, this is a different color magnitude diagram using blue and red. We conclude that the weak CN stars are evolved stars, they're not main sequence stars, evolved stars in the mass range, few to 10 solar masses, three to 10. <clears throat> we see them in Andromeda. You can see the color magnitude diagram of Andromeda. I've drawn a little outline to show the red giant branch and the tip of the red giant branch, which is this curved top. And I, I'm gonna leave this on here as I show you our triangulum. So Andromeda, triangulum, Andromeda, triangulum. Triangulum has a much smaller spread in metallicities and a lower metallicity. You can see that if you compare the two red giant branches. Andromeda's red giant branch is very spread out, both because of metallicity spread, high metallicity, and reddening. It's, uh, Andromeda's disk is very inclined. So M33's disk, M33 is a bit further away. You can see the red giant branch tip. It's actually, there's a little bit of daylight between the red giant branch tip and the line I've drawn. And because M33 is a little further away, but because it's an actively star-forming galaxy, M33, unlike M31, the weak CN sequence of massive evolved stars is very prominent in M33 compared to M31. See the difference. Okay. Uh, weak, CNC, uh, sequ uh, weak CN sequence is more prominent in M33. Again, lending credence to the hypothesis that these are massive evolved stars. We also see a trend in kinematics. So the same trend I showed you earlier, short-lived stars have the most regular kinematics, long-lived stars have the most irregular kinematics, and the weak CN stars and carbon stars appear to follow that trend. The carbon stars are more like AGP stars, the weak CN stars are more like even more massive stars. And this is a paper in, in progress. Uh, weak CN stars, again, their kinematics suggest that, they're more con that they are consistent with the kinematics of massive stars. Finally, I'll say a little bit about uh, the physics of, or, or the a study of pulsation. This is a, pulsation is also the acronym. We're trying to understand luminous stars and transients in our neighbor, the Andromeda galaxy. And what you're seeing here is a footprint of the FAT survey. The color coding is by number of visits. This color coding is by baseline. How, how much time has elapsed between multiple measurements of the same star? And uh, what we are able to do is look at the time domain aspect of the FAT survey, something that uh, others in the FAT survey haven't looked at before this. We have very high spatial resolution, very high photometric precision, but we have very limited and non-uniform cadence, as you can see from these two maps on the, uh, on the right. Now, um, here's an example of uh, two stars that are variable. You can see that we've made measurements over a period of six days, or in this case, over uh, six months. And you can see that both in the I band and in the B band, the brightness of the star has changed. Again, very limited cadence. We can't say anything about the light curve or the period, but we can just say that it is a variable. It's good for detection of variable, not so much for characterization. And uh, you can see very clearly here, two snapshots where the background star's brightnesses have stayed exactly the same. These are two snapshots in the I band, but this central star has dimmed in brightness. What you're seeing here is, um, I believe, uh, this star on the left here, where you're seeing um, the change in brightness from this epoch to this epoch over a period of five days. Um, here is, uh, we took known Cepheids and Andromeda, and you can very clearly see that if you have a baseline, if you have a time baseline of 10 days or more, we can very clearly see a high chi-squared in the brightness measurement, so a high uh, variation relative to photometric errors. Uh, this is the work of UCSC PhD student Shakni Mukherjee and Monica Sorai-Sam, uh, who's a postdoc at Illinois. And with that, I'll bring you back to my summary 
Thank you so much for giving me those extra minutes to speak, uh, Mr. Putala, but I'm happy to Thank take you. questions.